so welcome to um, today's uh, Liber Arstats Club. Um, so if you go to the Google Sheet uh, that has the links to everything, um, this, this session is actually a little bit more organized than other sessions uh, because um, you'll notice that, I mean, there's a link to the slide materials, but also to the code. So I already wrote the code prior to the session. Um, I'm gonna open this Google Doc that has, um, uh, so um, for Gio and Fernando, who I don't think have been here recently, I try to put the commands on the Google Doc for what are the packages you might need to install, the R packages. Um, I'm always using the latest R version. So right now it's R4.0. And I, it's basically like these Google Docs are a collection of links that I'll go through the session. Uh, but in this case, I'm already included the code, the R code. Um, so, um, um, so I will ask everyone to download this um, R script um, and we'll work on it um, at the end of the session. Um, and we'll, you know, this will be a good, uh, a good starting script to play around with some of these ideas. But let me let me explain the ideas first. So, uh, mm -hmm. um, so today, so I I thought that this would be a great session for today because of um, the recent work by some of you um, um, that are particularly some of you are, are starting like um, RNA seq project analysis and. Um, and that involves a lot of exploratory data analysis. <clears throat> and I thought that it would be great to see some of these type of plots for some of those projects. And um, in general, it's a, it's a nice uh, uh, set of R commands that can help a lot in many, in many different scenarios. So uh, I want to, to teach you how to make uh, a, a paired interactive visualizations. Um, so the idea is that we're going to have two interactive plots that are linked to each other. Um, that way, whenever you want to do something on the right side, for example, the left side will also be. Um, um, and there's a couple of ways of doing that. We'll see one way that involves the ggplot2 package and plotly. Um, um, so you can install all these packages. Some of them are biconductor packages. Um, and that's because I'm going to use some uh, BrainSeq phase two data as an example. So the main package that we're going to learn about today is called Plotly. Um, Plotly is actually um, um, it's an open source library, uh, um, and they have Plotly versions for other languages. This is Plotly R, um, but you can actually make Plotly plots using different programming languages. We'll focus on the R side for now. Um, I mean, that's because the one I, I'm more familiar with myself. Um, so the idea of Plotly is that uh, you end up making a small uh, website, a small HTML file um, that has a plot on it and then it is interactive. So um, this little website is quite good. And just like I mentioned in our ggplot2 session a couple months ago, I, the gallery here is quite useful. If you want to explore um, the different available plots and find something that looks similar to what you want to create. Um, and so uh, let's look, for example, at a scatter plot here. Um, Opening a new tab. Um, so, how this little website looks is um, it gives you like the R command for making a little plot. This one is using the Iris data set, which we've talked about, and, and, and we now prefer the Penguins data set instead of the Iris data set. Um, and just as a reminder, uh, the, the author of the Iris data set was uh, not a good person. Um, that's why everyone in the R community is trying to move away from it. Now, this little plot over here what's happening is you'll notice that the syntax is um, um, you know a new R syntax for plotting and so we won't actually use this 
plot underscore v function much. We'll use something else. But the idea is that you are providing it a data set, a data frame, and some variables that you want to plot. Um, and what you end up with here is a scatter plot of, uh, let's say, the length of the iris versus the, uh, sorry, the sepal length versus the petal length. And I'm getting slack, so let me close that. Okay. Um, and this linearly interactive plot over here um, has um, mouse over events. That way, like if I put my mouse over this point, we can see that it's uh, the coordinate on the x-axis is 6.3, on the y-axis is 6. And so that, you know, that information can be useful sometimes when you're exploring your data and you're like, okay, what is this outlier over here, right? Um, and you want to know more about it. Um, Plotly plots always have all these menu on the top, all these options here. So it says that like, produced by Plotly. Um, uh, you can compare data, I think. Um, I don't actually know how to use that, compare data. Um, all right. Shows, close, closes data on cover. Um, I have used the reset axis. So that's useful if, for example, I use the the zoom option, and I can zoom into a particular location of the plot. You, um, and let's say I want to go back, you can always click the reset axis. Right? Uh, so you have the zoom in, zoom out. Um, you can always select points using this lasso, for example. Um, and maybe, you know, if, if we had something more advanced, we could do something for like after selecting these points, then the second plot does something with those with only those points, for example. Um, I'm gonna double click to reset the selection. Uh, you can do lasso select or you can do a box selection. Um, um, then you can also, let's say that I, we zoom in, we can then pan to like navigate. Basically we're scroll, scrolling to our graph. Um, um, and you can always, um, oops, um, uh, you can always download the plot as a PNG file. Um, or if you want a static version of your plot. Um, so that, you know, those are the basics of Plotly. Um, it's a nice interactive library. Um, it doesn't work for every single type of plot that we make with R, but it works for a lot of them. And I mentioned that I wasn't going to use the plot underscore Z function much. And that's because Plotly itself, um, uh, we gotta go back to the R website, uh, Plotly R, there's a ggplot2 integration. And that's the one I use the most myself um, because um, they've spent a lot of time making ggplot2 uh, plots available to Plotly. Not every single ggplot2 plot is available, but a lot of them are. And the idea is you can just use this ggplotly command um, on any ggplot2 figure you have. And that way you can make um, plotly interactive graph. So let's look at, for example, this point example, the on point. Um, so this is going to be more familiar to us because here we're using, uh, we're going to create a random data set. Um, and we're here creating a data frame that has three variables. One of them is a condition that's either A or B, an X variable and a Y variable based on some normal distributed data. Um, once we have our little data frame, we then make our ggplot2 plot using um, the commands from ggplot2, which is like, for example, ggplot, our data, what is on the X variable, what is on the Y variable, and we want points, for example. Uh, now, a lot of times at this, at this stage, you might actually just print the plot. One big difference here is that we're assigning our plot object, our ggplot2 object, into an object. Here we're just calling it key. Um, and why is that? Because then that's going to enable us to then use the ggplot function. And so at this point, you could you print p and see how that plot looks. It won't be an interactive plot because there's a ggplot2 uh, visualization. Um, but with ggplotly, we can then make an interactive plot 
clock. So this one over here, if I mouse over, we get the X var and Y var values, right? Um, and I can do again all the fun, all, all the fun things about zooming in, uh, selecting points, stuff like that. Um, so, so far this is uh, one interactive visualization, and now uh, we've seen how to make one using um, um, ggplot first, and then the ggplotly function, and that will get you most of the way. Um, uh, for a lot of plots, um, or, or a lot of the ones that we, we like to make, right? Um, some of them might be more complicated, and uh, at that point, like maybe ggplotly, that the function itself might not be able to handle a more complicated graph, but for a lot of them, it will. And remember, right now, we're mostly focusing on like exploratory data analysis, and so we don't need the fanciest looking plot, you know? It's just one that, you know, we just need one that works for exploring our data. Um, so that's Plotly in general, but now um, I wanna open the second link here, which is uh, subplots. Um, so subplots is how you can um, combine two plots together. So um, uh, I'm gonna click over here in the subplots link. Um, and the idea of this is we now have two plotly uh, uh, interactive graphs, objects. So in this case, we're gonna have like a figure one and a figure two. Uh, and the way we can combine them together into a single interactive visualization is, is using the subplot function. So subplot here will take um, any number of figures you want. So here we're saying we wanna combine figures one and two. And our new merge or combine figure, right? We just call fig. Here has, um, it's displaying both of them at the same time using the same like plotly functions. Um, and so now we have them, uh, you know, next to each other. Um, and like I can zoom, zoom in on the left, uh, I can zoom in on the right, reset on the right, reset on the left by double clicking, mouse over for example, um, um, and so that's a great thing, uh, you know, like uh, you just want to show the data next to each other, but you'll notice that there's no relationship really between them, right? Um, uh, like whatever I do on the right side doesn't affect what I do on the left, right? What we see on the left. Um, right. So that's subplots. Um, we've seen both of those links. And I'm gonna click on the arranging views. And you'll notice this is very, you know, tricky, but the first website was plotly.com forward slash R. We're gonna move now to a new website called plotly-r.com. So, um, almost the same, you know, looking website, but very different URLs. <laughs> I mean, very, almost the same URL, but like very different websites. This one, plotly-r.com, is actually a book down website. So it's a, book, uh, a website using uh, an R package for making books. Um, and uh, there's a chapter on that book called Arranging Views. Um, and so these arranging views explains different ways of using the subplot function. And so uh, that same documentation that we saw on the previous page is explained again sometimes using the, the same graphics. So here we're, they're still using the, the unemployment and employment graph. Um, and the way this book works is that a lot of these images, if you double click on them, it actually, sorry, if you single click on them, not double, it opens a new window in your browser that has the interactive plot lead plot. So then you can like test it out, for example. So, um, like on the left side here, I was zooming into a specific uh, window of time uh, and nothing happened on the right. So, so, so far it's the same information, but on a different website. Now that's only figure 13.1. Uh, let's look at um, a figure 13.2. So I'm gonna left click once. So I'm gonna open this on a new browser window and this is a more, more complicated um, interactive plot, right? Because now we have 
one, two, three, four, five different tracks of information. What is, you know, uh, peculiar about it is that now all of them share the X axis. And what, why is that gonna matter? Because if I subset here on one of them, it actually automatically subsets on the rest of them. Um, um, so that, you know, maybe that's all we want for exploring our data, like saying like, okay, if I subset, um, you know, my one variable on, on, on this axis, I want the rest of them to automatically update. And maybe that's all we want to do for our exploratory data analysis. Um, how did we do that? So we, in this case, there's a list of plots that we have and we're using the subplot function for it. But now we're, we're gonna use more arguments for that function. One of them is called the number of rows. So this is, uh, we have a little um, um, matrix of plots. And we're gonna say we don't want um, just um, one row per plot that we have because we want all of them stacked on top of each other. And we're gonna turn on the share X argument. We're gonna say that the X, the X axis is the same one for all those plots. Um, so that's how we made this little figure over here, 13.2. Um, the matrix stuff that I, was, that I mentioned, the number of rows and stuff, has to do with um, the versatility of this function um, for arranging the plots. Because right now we're arranging them in the same, we're giving each of them the same area. But you can actually you know, build this matrix as, you know, as complicated as you want. And in this case, there's an example where the top left corner called number one is smaller than the bottom left corner called number four because maybe we want a taller plot there, a taller area. Um, so this, you know, those arguments can be helpful for combining the plots. Uh, so this is an example of doing that where they want most of the area um, um, dedicated to this contour plot and a little bit of the area dedicated to the heat map over here on the right side, which is which serves in this case as a color scale. Um, uh, you can make more complicated things. Um, all right, so um, one last thing here is um, that I actually didn't mention on, on the list of packages, but there's this package called Gigi Ally, or as other people pronounce it as Gigali. Yeah. I think it's Gigi Ally. Um, um, uh, that this particular package has a very powerful function called G pairs that creates um, a matrix of plots for a set of variables they have in a data frame. And I just wanted to highlight that ggplotly works with G pairs. So you can actually make an interactive version of this. So if I left click once, it opens in a new browser. Uh, window. Um, um, you know, this is uh, it's, it's all combined using like subplot. So, um, but they're not actually doing much to each other, except one thing. Um, oh, it's not recent. Anyway, uh, you'll notice now this thing um, on my window where um, among the linked scatter plots, which are uh, these three cells, these two cells and this third cell, among them, if I click on any point, um, it automatically highlights that point in the other plots. And so this is using a new feature um, and, and you can tell that it's using an, um, something new because on the mouse over information is showing something called dot cross talk key. Um, and it says it's in key 86 um, for that particular point. If I click on another point, it gives us something else. And so uh, this is using another uh, like JavaScript library that allows you to update interactively your other plots based on information, uh, based on what, uh, you know, clicking and stuff like that that you do on one plot. And this is the thing that I wanted to highlight to some of you because uh, right now, for example, um, 
like Luis and Josh are exploring some data. Um, and sometimes we want to, you know, check what happens to one outlier, right? Uh, in a set of plots, is it an outlier on, a, on, a, on an another set of plots, right? And this could be quite powerful for exploring that, uh, or, you know, interactively exploring your data and then deciding, okay, maybe we need to have a cutoff. Um, maybe some of our samples are bad, we need to remove them because they're outliers in multiple of these plots, maybe they're not, things like that. Um, so that's the quick way of doing this, is using ggpairs from ggalli, then ggplotly. Now, um, uh, this um, uses a set of plots, and maybe we want to do something a bit more customized. Um, so at that point, I'm going to look, I'm going to jump to chapter number 16 called client-side linking. Uh, so this is where we're going to learn more about that cross talk key. So um, we're going to use two new functions. One of them is called, called highlight underscore key. The other one is called highlight. Highlight underscore key, what it takes as input is um, a table, a data frame. And the column for what's going to be our unique identifier for, uh, for our data. Um, so that's our key column. Um, and the output of highlight key is a very specific object that is basically this interactive table um, that uh, knows how to link uh, you know, uh, different parts of it. And we're going to use that interactive table as our input to multiple plotting functions. In this particular case, they're uh, feeding that interactive table to the plot underscore Lee function. But we could also feed this interactive table to um, ggplot, um, the function from ggplot2. Once we make our interactive table, um, I mean, sorry, our interactive plot using this interactive table that has a specific key, we can later on use the function highlight. And the function highlight has arguments for controlling what are the things we want to do. Um, when do we want our functions to be linked to each other? Um, uh, so um, let me see what example I want to show. Okay, so this one is a particularly uh, fun example over here because um, what it's showing is uh, uh, a bunch of lines, and if I click on them, it keeps showing all the selected lines. Um, and I can actually, now it's, um, sorry, it's also, we also have a little text box on the top. And this, this is uh, information I think about, um, uh, I think the median income for some cities um, across time. Um, and so every time I click on one of them, we get a new city name on the top. So maybe actually I want to delete El Paso. Um, and so it, it automatically deleted that line uh, on the bottom. Um, maybe I want to add like Austin, because I don't know which one Austin is, right? And then that automatically added it to, to my list of, um, of, uh, of of lines. So that could be, you know, this type of um, highlight uh, option. Ah, I went to the, sorry, I went to the next chapter accidentally. Um, <laughs> um, this type of highlighting can be quite powerful. Uh, because it, it allows you to, you know, uh, to either get the more details about the data that you're looking at or search for it um, through a different interface. Right? Um, you can also change the color. So maybe, you know, I highlighted Austin in red and now I want to highlight this new one in blue. Uh, and the new one, I guess, was Lufkin. I don't know if that's a, I guess that's a city. 
Um, and how do we do that? So that actually we use the options um, selectize, dynamic, and persistent. All of those options, we made them true. So the selectize option, I think, is the menu. The persistent means that after clicking, it still it keeps the previous ones highlighted too. Um, and I think the dynamic might be the colors. Um, uh, but I, we, you know, can look at the details of this uh, help function or highlight. So now we have all the pieces to make an interactive graph ourselves, ourselves. And so um, that's actually all this stuff that I explained is how I made some of the interactive graphs on the spatial LIBD package. Um, um, uh, some of those plots, uh, some of these interactive plots were made using uh, Plotly. Um, yeah, it's still loading, anyway. Um, and, um, oh, there, it there it goes. So I actually made this plot using Plotly. Uh, uh, you can see the mouse over and stuff. And some of them are a bit more complicated. Um, um, like these clusters interactive one, um, which takes a little bit to load. But that's how, um, um, like here I have four plotly plots and they're all linked to each other. And like, um, you can see now if I mouse over, you'll see the dot cross dot key argument popping up on the mouse over. That's how the information across all of them is linked. But these are more, you know, a more complicated plot, and it does a lot of things. Um, and some of that code here, I, I put the actual link to the code there. If you want to see some how the, de the details of how some of that those plots were made, and that code is already public. But let's play around with this stuff with Plotly. And so for that, I'm going to use public data from the BrainSeq Phase Two project, um, um, where we have all these data publicly available. And in particular, one of the links here on, um, um, where is it? Um, um, oh, phenotype data. Oh, right. That's the one I'm looking for. This phenotype data here is a small R data file that, um, that includes the demographic table. Um, and so this is basically, a, if we, if, for those of you familiar with uh, summarized experiment objects, this is basically the information on the call data of one of the big objects that we have. So instead of downloading one of the bigger ones, I'm just gonna download them, the phenotype data. Um, so that's where this, this uh, second to last link comes from, this, uh, methylation proportion uh, phenotype data also. So at this point, I'm gonna jump into the uh, code that I provided um, uh, because um, this is gonna allow us, give us enough time to, to run this example. So in case you, you know, in case you need some of these packages, you can just on, on comment those lines. If you're using Mac, that would be command shift C on our studio. Um, to uncomment these lines and just execute uh, lines four to 12 to install um, the packages that we were gonna need. Um, uh, I'm gonna select lines 16 to 20 and execute them with command enter. Um, that's just loading all the packages. Um, so I'm gonna load a package called bioc file cache, which is useful when you wanna download data from the web. Um, but also keep it in your computer in case you're gonna use it again in the future. We're gonna use the S4 vectors package because that's the actual phenotype data that I'm accessing is a little bit complicated. Um, it's not a regular R data frame. It's what's called a capital data frame. So, uh, so this package is the one that defines the classes for that. Next, we're gonna use ggplot2 to make us, uh, some plots, plot B for the interactive, 
stuff and then session information for the repetitively information at the end. So um, I explained how, you know, where we I got this link to the methylation portion phenotype, our data file. Um, the next thing is that I'm going to use BioC file cache for um, saving the data in my computer. Um, so right now I'm going to use a default location. If this is the very first time that you're running this command, it's going to show you on your um, on your command prompt, on your terminal prompt, um, whether you want to create a directory. And the answer is going to be yes or no. So you should say yes to that. Um, once I have that, then I can um, wait. Oh, I'm not sure if I made that. But oh, I forgot to run lines 23 and 24 first. Um, so what this will do is uh, it. Um, in my case, my BIOC file cache is under my uh, Mac uh, username, library caches, and then there's a specifically random, um, random looking uh, ID for my file. And so BIOC file cache here recognized that I had already downloaded this data and the data that I have in my computer is the latest version. So once I have that uh, data downloaded, I'm just gonna load it using the load function. Uh, with variables equals true. And we see here that I'm loading a, a, a table called PD. Um, this is actually a capital data frame object. Uh, so the class PD, which is a capital data frame object from the S4 vectors package. That's why we had a, a loading in line 17. Um, so this actually is a, is a bit of a complicated table um, and I'm not gonna use all the information here for this example. Uh, and it's a bit complicated because a lot of those of the columns here are what are called list columns. So they have more than one value per entry. Um, and um, I'm just gonna um, dodge that problem for now, um, just for this data. Um, that is more specific to this S4 vectors stuff. And so actually, uh, I'm going to keep every single column that is not one of those list columns. So the way I can do that is using the grep l function, which is the logical grep, uh, grep l. And I'm going to ask, are any of those classes list? Yes or no? Uh, with a question, with an um, exclamation mark, I can negate it. Um, so um, I'm going to keep the ones that are not lists. Once I do that, I'm gonna keep all those columns with the syntax of the square bracket, comma, columns I want, close square bracket. And I'm gonna uh, convert this into regular uh, data dot frame object. Um, so I'm doing all of this that way, like ggplot2 and plotly and all those functions will know what to do. Um, they don't really know how to work with capital data frames. So at this point, we have our little table of data from BrainSeq phase two. Um, the dimensions are 900 rows. So we have actually 900 samples in this project with 36 columns of phenotype information for them. If I print what it is, I actually have what's called the R number, which is the liver um, ID for the RNA sample. The BR num, which is a brain number ID for that sample. Brain region, which in this case, Brain sick phase two was two brain regions and the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, the LPFC, and the hippocampus, age, and some other variables. So uh, there's a lot of information here, but what I need for my example is a variable that is unique across all of them. And so that's actually the R num for this in this particular case, because that's the we're talking about an RNA sequencing project. So each sample has a unique ID. Um, and then we can verify that, you know, we have 900 unique IDs and we actually have 900 samples. So um, I'm gonna say that my key column, I'm gonna just create a key column and say that's, you know, the R num column. 
this is not uh, strictly necessary, but I'm just doing it, in, you know, so it's a bit more um, step by step. Next, uh, we're going to use the highlight underscore key function from the plotly package. Um, so plotly. Um, on this data frame, and I'm going to tell it what is the key column. So actually, I could actually use here like tilde R num, um, but uh, I just created my key column just to make it more explicit. And so I'm saving this resulting highlighted table as PD on the score key. And if we look at the class of it, it's, um, it's a bit of a complicated class. Um, um, uh, but I mean, we don't really care about that. We, what we care is that uh, we can use it with ggplot2 and plot i um, sorry. Um, so I'm going to make a little plot. And here I'm going to compare the mean mitochondrial mapping rate against the mean total gene assignment rate. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to color the points by the brain region. Um, so, and I want some points on the end using geom point. So all of this is ggplot2 syntax, and I'm saving it into an object instead of just plotting it. Um, that way, later on, I can use that object. Here, I'm just going to print the object so we can see the plot. Um, um, so this is how the data looks like. I have the mean mitochondrial mapping rate on the x-axis, total assigned gene rate on the y-axis, uh, with colors here um, differentiating the two brain regions. And um, uh, we actually see, a, uh, um, let's see, like two clouds of points. We have like this blue cloud of points over here that's a little bit tilted. So there's a, an association between total gene assignment rate and mean, mean mitochondrial mapping rate. Then we have some other points that are much lower in the mean mitochondrial mapping rate. And they don't seem to have an association with a total gene assignment rate. And actually here we have all the red points, all the DLPFC points plus some blue hippocampus points. Um, and that uh, is actually you know, part of the complicated part of, of analyzing this particular data set. And that was because um, DLPFC and some of the hippocampus samples were prepared with one specific protocol. The rest of the hippocampus samples were prepared with a different RNA-seq protocol. Um, but I mean, I know that story, um, but uh, here we can, because let's like if we're imagine that, that we're starting an analysis, you wouldn't know that full story, and so this plot would tell you like, oh, something seems something seems wrong. Let's look into it into more detail. So that's just one plot. I'm now going to make another plot that's also going to have the mean mitochondrial mapping rate on the x-axis, but on the y-axis, I'm going to have a different variable. Here we're going to have the ring, what is called the RNA integrity number. Um, so I'll make that plot, and let's see it too. <coughs> um, <laughs> mm. Welcome here. Why are you giving me a white plot? Oh, there he goes. Okay, cool. Um, so this, again, the uh, the, the x-axis stay the same, but now the y-axis is a bit different. And we again see um, two types of relationships. Like we see like one cloud over here that has red and blue points, and then maybe another like cloud of blue points over here that is associate, that shows an association between uh, ring and mitochondrial mapping rate. So, so far, those were two ggplot2 uh, plots that we made. Um, let's make them interactive. So for that, we're going to use the plotly function uh, ggplotly. Um, so I'll run it on both objects. And you'll notice I'm creating new objects. I'm calling them p instead of gg, just to differentiate what is the package um, involved in making them. So those are two interactive plots. And so I'll just print the first one. Um, and we're going to get on this viewer like uh, uh, 
the plotly interface, right? That way we can mouse over points and we'll see like, oh, uh, you know, this particular point that I'm mousing over, like, I mean, let me choose an easier one. This one over here that is uh, isolated. Uh, that one corresponds to you know, sample R4725. Um, and we can see the actual values of the mean mitochondrial mapping rate and the mean total gene assignment rate. And we know that it's a hippocampus uh, sample. So like, this is how like, let's say you could, you could try to identify, for example, um, <clears throat> what are these brains here? Uh, and you know, what is different between brain R5588 versus R1142? You know, this, you know, that could start to give you some ideas and eventually you might land into the, into the, the two type of um, library uh, preparation protocols. Um, and then at that point you'll see um, what is the difference between the two classes of points. But um, um, uh, all the point of all these interactive graphs is that we're gonna, they're gonna help us get there. So now that we have two interactive graphs made with Plotly, we're gonna combine them together. We're gonna combine them using the subplot uh, function. And uh, I was, you know, I was, I explicitly decided to keep the mean mitochondrial mapping rate as the X axis on both of my plots. Why do I wanna do that now? Why did I do that? Because then I, I wanted them to have the same, the same uh, shared X axis. The Y axis is different, so uh, they don't share that. Um, and I wanna have them next to each other, so I'm gonna have one row of plots. Um, and um, the which layout argument is just for, um, um, uh, which is the one that determines the, the, the legends. So I've merged them together now. And if I print that object, we're gonna get a plot interface that has the plots next to each other. Um, um, so it has the plots next to each other here. Um, and because they share the same X axis, that means that if, um, if, uh, sorry, messed up. Uh, let me open this bigger. Um, okay, so I have the same shared x axis. So that means if I mouse over the x axis on one of them, oops, let me select the box selection. Uh, mm, oh, there. Okay, cool. If I select over here on the right, uh, it didn't update the left side. I was expecting it to update the left side. Okay. Um, well, well, that's part of it. I'm not sure what is, why they're not fully linked in that sense, but they're supposed to be sharing the x-axis. Maybe I had to have them one on top of the, each other. Uh, so let me try that quickly. Uh, 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 I have them on top of each other. Maybe now I can uh, zoom in on one. Um, let me try box selection. Um, I forget how to make this work, but in theory, I should be able to select a portion of the X axis on one and get the other one to work. Um, anyway, let me restore my plot. Um, um, okay. Uh, so, this plot over here also has the crosstalk key enabled. That way, if I select a single point, uh, it highlights that same point on the right side. Um, it's not, uh, that's using like the default options for the highlight 
um, uh, function. And so like I can shift left click on a second point and that will highlight a second point on the right side. Um, but actually like um, if I double click anywhere, it's not resetting my view. It's not resetting the points that I highlighted. And so at that point, we, wanna, we might want to use the highlight function. So for example, here we can specify what is the event, the plot event, that will turn on the highlighting and will turn it off. So I'm gonna say here that clicking is gonna be the one that turns it on and double clicking is the one that, will turn, that turns it off. Um, um, and this can, this can be useful for like uh, resetting your, your plot. So here when I left click once, um, that's gonna highlight that point. If I double click anywhere else, um, supposed to turn it off. Let me see it on the ground. So left click, it turns the highlighting on. Yeah, double click outside of it, resets the view. Um, sometimes RStudio, I don't know if you know, but RStudio itself is a browser. Um, and so maybe your, uh, uh, your actual browser might have more powerful features, more powerful features. Um, okay, so you can, uh, another thing you could do is maybe you want to have the highlight be uh, when you hover the mouse um, instead of when you click on points. Um, so if you highlight, if you mouse over for like two or three seconds, you interpret that, as a, interpret that as a mouse over event. And so this might be more dynamic because you don't need to be resetting your view every time. Um, but it also means that like, let's say here I'm mousing over, I move my mouse away, I need to move it away quickly so I can see the point on the right side. Because if I mouse over and slowly, you know, move somewhere else, then move away, I get a different point on the right side and on the left, right? Um, uh, and we can then use also the full like selectize, true dynamic, true persistent, true options. It will make a much fancier plot um, uh, that has more features. I'm gonna open it in the browser just because it's bigger there. Um, and so now we get the full menu over here that we can be like, okay, let's look at brain uh, with ID R12200, right? And so that you know shows me that brain on the graph. Or I can just uh, shift like click and add another point over here. And um, this window is too big, but um, um, you might not be seeing it on Zoom. But this point I just highlighted has a red uh, 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 field circle inside of it. And that's because of the brush, the brush color that I'm using. So maybe I wanna change it to purple. And so my next selection is gonna have a little purple circle in the middle of it. Right. And so this can be useful if you're like looking at different points. And so we just a couple of functions. We can take our ggplot2 visualizations, make them interactive and have linked um, visualizations. And this type of thing can be really useful if you're gonna discuss it in like a lab meeting or with your you know, fellow team members. Uh, and you're you know at the stage where you're exploring the data and you're like, okay, what is this, you know, very extreme point over here? Can you tell me more about it, right? Um, um, and the, the information that you see on the mouse over depends on how much information you fed into your ggplot2 function. So you could have more information there, um, uh, and then it will like automatically show. Um, let's say you actually want to save it. At this point, we are going to use the HTML widgets package. It has a save widgets function. And um, here I'm, I'm, I'm specifying, I think, the code from line 85, which is maybe the one I like the most myself. Um, um, 
specifying that plotting um, plotly function and I'm giving it a name file. And so I'm going to call it index.html. And what this will do is um, on my computer, it created the index.html uh, file, um, uh, which is 3.8 megabytes. And then I can open this um, on my browser. So, um, and I can like, you know, send it to Fernando or some collaborator, right? And they can be like, oh, here's my interactive plot, right? So instead of a instead of a PDF or a PNG or something, um, you send HTML plots and save them as HTML. Um, and then the last thing here is like, actually, some of you might be interested in lines one or two or one or three. These are lines for automatically styling the the uh, the R Studio file that I have selected, and then the reproducibility information of how I made this stuff. Um, so with that, let me. Stop recording. Uh, zoom, zoom. Where's my zoom? Here we are. Uh.